And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. It's the final installment of our NAM trilogy. Meet master film score mixer Alan Meyerson. You're going to learn a lot and a brand new ITL. You're at the place. Pensado's place! Very good. Give yourselves yeah. a round of applause. Who's Pensado? Oh, what's that? Who's that guy? That's him. That's Chongor oh, Pensado. Man. Yeah, handsome absolutely. Man. He's your son. You didn't even know it. Yes, I um, This is literally uh, royalty that you're about to meet. He is a great guy, a talented guy. Please welcome to the stage, Alan Meyerson. Come on up, Alan. Alan! <laughs> <laughs> and he's live streaming. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. All right, thank you for that. <laughs> Welcome, man. Alan, How are you? Good to see you. You've been hanging out with Hans Zimmer too much. This video stuff, <laughs> man. We need you on the audio side more. Hey, buddy. Love you, buddy. Love you. So, a tremendous background as a mixer and, a, and an engineer to begin with, and then this transition to music scoring mixer is almost more of what you're doing these days, correct? Well, I, almost completely. 100% damn near. Well, not only scoring, but video games, TV shows, everything for media has let, really been what I've been doing. Let me give, give you a sense of some of the films he's been involved with, one way or the other. And I'm just doing 2017, I'm not going in the past. X-Men, Hidden Figures, Father Figures, Jumanji, Dunkirk, Wonder Woman, Pirates of the Caribbean, Kung Skull Island, Fist Fight. These movies are like weekend after weekend after weekend. Alan Meyerson's name is on it. And I haven't gone back to 16 or there's, 15, all the other stuff. It's been a good year. There's a rule in the industry. <laughs> if you go to a movie and it sounds good, Alan did it. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that. I, 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 I left out The Greatest Showman. Which I is swear. Our by friend. the way, shout out to Simon Franklin. He's here too. Where's Where Simon? Uh, okay. Um, so define for us, Alan. What is a music scoring mixer? What's, what's the definition of it? So, you know, the role changes depending on who the composer is and what the project is, but basically, I'm the finisher. I'm the guy that brings it home at the end of the project in terms of the mix. So in a film score, you could have a lot of elements that are created on a computer, that are samples, or that are synth things. And then basically, for most film still, orchestral music is the, is the language of film for the most part. So we record orchestral music. If it happens in LA, I record it. If it happens in London or somewhere else, sometimes I record it. Sometimes I get to go like on, on Thor. I actually went to London and recorded it. But a lot of times other people record it and then I get to mix it. So then what I do is I take that product that I do, that final mix, which is a final music mix, and I hand it off to one of my fellows, Ron Bartlett being the perfect example, who was here earlier today. Yep. And I say, here's the music, it's done. And hopefully if I've done my job right, for the most part, they could sit there with one finger on one fader and ride that music up and down around the dialogue and effects. But we give them the opportunity to have a little bit more control if they need it. And, and in, in the film world, you've got sound effects, dialogue, music, are those the kind of components that That's you deal the with three, all the time? Those are the three components. Got you. So right. th those are the elements that you have to deal with right. to make sure all marry. And right, so back in the old days, it used to be three mixers on a dub stage. There was a music mixer, a dialogue mixer, and a sound effects mixer. But nowadays, uh, basically because of technology and because of budget concerns, they, the music mixer, since there's less to do on a stage for a music mixer because most of it gets delivered kind of finished, um, except in a very rare case, you'll have uh, a dialogue and a sound effects mixer, and one of the two will cover the music, usually the dialogue mixer. Gotcha. How many, uh, like, uh, how many, <laughs> how many tracks do you get, do you get normally? You, you guys get massive amounts of tracks. Well, right? our, our sessions get really big because not only do we get a lot of tracks in terms of what the pre-production is, but then if we record an orchestra, you know, each pass of the orchestra could be as many as 70 tracks. So, say like on an example like Thor, which I was showing before, um, it's a single recording. Everyone's in the room at the same time. So it's a 72-track thing, but that's it. So I have an orchestra, 70 tracks. It's one element, an orchestra, 70 tracks. So you can think of it as one thing or as 70 things, depending on how you look at it. And then I have a choir, and then I have pre-records. So even on that, a very, very simple session, that's 200 tracks. Now, you go to a movie like Pirates or you go to a movie like Jumanji where we've recorded every percussion element separate. We've recorded, uh, in, that, in Jumanji's case, the orchestra was recorded together, but in Pirates, the, the long strings, the short strings, the long brass, the short brass, the solo elements, 
all separate. You end up with sessions that sometimes are over a thousand tracks. Whoa. What? Yeah, it's crazy. So, so what we basically do is we split it up. We, I have a rig. I have in my studio. I have three Pro Tools rigs wired up all the time. And there's one rig that's my destination. It's home base. It's where I print my stems. It's where I do my stem mastering because I do a mastering process on all the stems. All that happens in a separate rig. And then I have a rig on a big movie that's my orchestral and live recording uh, session. And then the, the other rig will be pre-records and, and percussion. And the reason the percussion's there is because I'm going to want to line it up with the sample percussion so that... How could they do that in the dark ages of tape? Yeah, well, it was, movies didn't sound like this in the dark ages of tape. You know, the movies in those days were, you know, and, and still some of the greatest scores ever. Yeah. The John Williams scores, the Alan Silvestri scores, the Jerry Goldsmith scores were basically performances. And, you know, you'd have a band perform and then an orchestra perform and then a fantastic mixer mix it all together. And that was it. But, you know, right around 1995, 1996, that all changed. Who are some of the... You're, you're closely associated with Hans Zimmer, but you worked with a lot of people. Right. Who are some of the other folks you've worked with? I work, I, I work a lot with this guy, Henry Jackman, who's a genius. He's, we, we did... We're going to do three movies this year. We did Skull Island and Jumanji last year. I, I work with Mark Mothersbaugh. I, I work with Rupert Gregson-Williams. I've, through the years, worked with Harry Gregson-Williams and John Powell and... Newton, James Newton Howard and Danny Elfman, um, all the guys. And, and I put a lot of my energy into young composers, too. I really believe there's this guy, uh, I just did a movie with John Debney, Greatest Showman, but uh, there's a young guy named Joe Trapanese who's just a brilliant composer who I met eight years ago on Tron, who's now coming, you know, he's already been into his own. He did, um, he did uh, Straight Outta Compton and so many great movies, but now he's really starting to blossom, but I really love working with young composers on small scores. What, well, they, makes, a, oh, what makes a composer good? I have no clue. You know, what they tell the story. It's all about storytelling in film. You know, it's like where in pop music, it's Sorry. about the vocal, and it's about the message that the vocal brings. And the music in a film score is about taking the message that's on the screen and enhancing it or directing an audience to really look at a scene in a certain way. It's amazing. It's a great test. You know, and they do it in, in schools all the time, um, it, where you take a piece of music, you put up a scene, you take a piece of music, and you can make people cry. You take that same scene, you put up another piece of music, and you can make people laugh, you know? And it's just incredible what music does. I mean, music really is the silent partner. Hans called it the wings of a film. You know, it really lets the film fly. And for the audience, in like I said, in the last three days, we've had the producers of Bruno Mars and Adele and Sam Smith. We've had the producers of Despacito. There's somebody like Alan Meyerson. We had the guys who did Radiohead. We had Noah Passavoy, Passavoy who's really Maroon 6 or Maroon 5. Oh, that was a good one. Um, Battle Cat, who really started hip hop. Everybody, everybody, everybody has said the story is the thing. From hit songwriters, a bunch of these guys were on their way to the Grammys. So you can be doing all the music you want, you can be messing with all the technology you want, but if you're not on a good story, you're not going to get right. there. So the focus on the story, on the song, on whatever the messaging is, is so critical in it, all of content, not just right. music, but in it, all of content. It's really not about the technology. And the great thing about 2018 is there's so much great technology that it sort of takes away technology being an advantage or a disadvantage for any one person. Everyone on their laptop has the same ability to do the same thing that I do or Greg Wells does or Manny Marikin does. You know, it's just, it's all there. It's all ready to be used and it's all about that. I mean, I, I, I did a demo recently where I showed a scene and I showed how like, I could almost, and I'm not saying this is something I could do in particular, but that music, when handled the right way, can almost make you cry if it's just manipulated the slightest bit, if you just sort of work the peaks and valleys around what's happening in the dialogue. I remember this, this uh, one scene I worked on a long time ago with Hans on a movie, um, As Good As It Gets. And there's this one scene where Helen Hunt closes her eyes and that closing of the eyes sort of acknowledges that she gets what Jack Nicholson said. And Hans just wrote that moment, you know, and it was just like, I'm like, how do, you, how do you know how to do that? You know, it's yeah. like, I mean, I don't know how to do that, but you know, the people that are great at what they do, and it's not just, and, and this applies to pop music too. It's, it's about a breath, or it's about, 
a, a vocal reverb that cuts off at, at a certain point, or it's about emotional peaks and valleys. It's taking them up and letting them back down. Has that enhanced your record mixing, doing this ty these types of things? It seems like it would. Yeah, I don't get to do as much record mixing as I used to. It, 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 last year was pretty interesting because uh, I was on a couple of movies where on this movie Sing, I ended up mixing a bunch of songs for the score, which, which actually was a ton of fun. I did, I mixed all these Seth MacFarlane songs that are sort of these Sinatra style songs. And I mixed a song for, um, for um, uh, I mixed a version of Hallelujah oh, with yeah. um, Jennifer Hudson and, um, and an amazed Tori Kelly. And, and it was just so great to do it. But yes, it's all about storytelling. You know, it's all about that. Go back to the technology side, since everybody yeah. deal with technology. We, we love really technology. But, I love technology, by the way. But technology, you have to use it and not allow it to use you. You, you have to be the master of your technology. You know, at the same time, you have to allow yourself the opportunity to ex discover new things and make mistakes and see where that can take you Absolutely. to. You know, one of the, I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I, I, I get an assistant. You know, a lot of people don't get assistants anymore, but I do. And, and once I get an assistant to a point where they're comfortable, they integrate certain things. You know, we, we have this massive, as you can imagine, my template, my build for doing, for delivering these stems and having these thousand track mixes is pretty intense. So there's something, when I sit down at my console, my, when I sit down at my S6, it has to be set up in a certain way that I've developed over the years. But, you know, uh, every now and then they throw a little surprise in, like, and I remember when I was a young mixer and I remember working with Stephen Haig, every time I did a mix with him, there would always be a fader, right? Say, push that fader. And he never knew what was gonna be underneath that fader. And 90% of the time it, it didn't work, but every now and then he'd, he'd go like, wow, that's pretty cool. It's a delay, it's a low end thing. So Forrest, my assistant would do that to me. He'd like, find a plugin that he thought I would like, and he'd go like, hey, try this. Just see what happens with that. What plugins do you like? Oh, God. That's a, that's a long list, I bet. Yeah, I, I, love, I love, you know, there's so much of the Wave stuff I love, so much of the UAD stuff I love. There's this, uh, this multi-band compressor limiter by this company, Whole Grain, called the Quartet, which is, I love it. I love fab filter stuff. I, I'm a junkie, I, own, I have everything, you know, there isn't a plugin I don't have, I, and I'll always find a use for something, and sometimes I just get into a mode, like I'll get into, I, I'm gonna use the Avitas E27 EQ, and that's gonna be my EQ in this mix, and I just set it up, so on my S6, you know, I can set up a preset EQ, and when I hit the EQ button, an EQ pops up. So I can, I can like build an SSL for a mix, or I can build an API for a mix with, with a Fairchild, so I do that a lot, I go into modes, you know, we did a, a, a movie recently where uh, he said to me, I'd love this to sound like an old analog SSL mix. I'm like, well, it's gonna be an old analog SSL mix. And I just used a 4000 for everything. A little bit of compression, a little Dave Pensato in it, a little bit of top end, a little bit of compression. <laughs> and sounded great, brought back a lot of memories. Alan, who are your heroes? I've, I've known you forever and I've never asked you that question. What? When you were a young engineer starting out in New York, who were the engineers that you idolized? In oh. the same way I idolized you when I was starting out. Um, you know, I, when I was young, I, got, I had this unique privilege to work with an engineer named Gary Chester. I, none of, you guys probably don't know who he is. Gary was a New York legend. I, I started out doing jingles. And the great thing about doing jingles is you learn how to be fast, and you learn how to be good, and you learn how to finish. You become a finisher. Every single day you had to finish, you know? And Gary was the fastest engineer I ever met. He taught me so much about the process of working with musicians, getting things done, ev having everyone leave with a smile on their face, getting a great headphone mix, stuff like that. was the number one thing I learned. As an assistant engineer, the first thing I was taught is your job is to get a great headphone mix. I'll take care of everything else. You make the headphone mix. That was my job. So I'd like interject delays just for the headphones and my own reverbs and stuff like that. I got into it, you know? I was like, it was a glory days. It was the New York in the 70s, you know? So it was a lot of fun. Gary was a huge influence. There was a, a, an engineer named Ed Sprigg. When I went to the Hit Factory, I was an engineer at the Hit Factory for a few years. I worked with this guy, Ed Sprigg, who was the first guy I ever saw put up a room mic and stick two delays on it. And, and 
put modulation on him and do crazy shit. We, you know, he brought a, one thing, we brought a trash can in the studio with a bunch of dead fall leaves and like made noises and sampled it and put it on a tape loop. And so I was like, oh, okay, so learn the rules and then ignore Break. the rules. Yeah. You know, that, exactly. was, that was what he taught me. And uh, unfortunately he passed away. Um, and then there are the influences, just the great mixers. You know, uh, Bob, you know, in, uh, in this building, Bob Clearmount, and I think that there probably isn't an engineer in this building that doesn't owe a little bit of something to Bob Clearmountain. You know, I agree. he was I agree. Ken Scott, the old Supertramp records, Crime of the Century, Robin Cable, the Elton John records. I became a fan of mixing Jim Gaines, the old uh, Return to Forever records and stuff like that. You know, just the record after record of the, you know, my era is the 70s, you know, so those records, Earth, Wind and Fire, but George Massenberg, you know, these guys, I just, started listening and I started pulling, what do I want my stuff to sound like? Oh, I'd like to have the punch of the drums of a George Massenberg with the size of the low end of a Bob Claremont. And then you get it wrong a hundred times until you get it right, yep. yeah. you know? Which is an advice you guys can utilize today. Who are the guys you like today? And by the way, one of the questions I wanted to ask because we've been having a very male-centric conversation. Are there female composers in the business, female mixers, other folks? Yes, there are. And, and, I, and, and not only is that, my assistant now is, is a female and she's doing a great job. I, I've had quite a few uh, women work with me. One of them, Lori Castro now, is engineering on her own. I was fortunate enough when I was uh, uh, working at Larrabee to have an assistant named Sylvia Massey. Sylvia! Who went on to do some good stuff on her own. And, and I was, you know, she was my assistant, and she would smoke her Virginia Slims, and, <laughs> and I remember, she's like, she, I had gear, you know, I was like, I was an early gear guy, you know, I was a, an early drum replacement guy, so I had an S1000 and an, and an ME35T, which was a MIDI, uh, an audio to MIDI uh, trigger, and, and so Sylvia was mixing this band, and she said, could I borrow a piece, can I rent a piece of gear? I said, no but you can use anything you want, you know? And she used my gear, and this band was at the time called Green Jello, and then it became Green Jelly, and through that, she met this young unsigned band named Tool, and the rest is history. And yep. Sylvia is obviously one of the great engineer, producer, mixers in the world, so, so that was a huge thing. As far as composers go, uh, there are some great, Women compose, I mean, going back to the days, Rachel Portman is one of the classics, but nowadays there's a tremendous amount of uh, young female composers out there. And of course, I'm gonna draw a blank. Deborah, Deborah Lurie, um, uh, Penka, uh, Penka, Penka, no, Co I can't remember the name. I'm having a, it's been but there, a long but day. But there are some, and there's- There are, there are a few, there's not enough. Right. That voice is necessary, you know? It's like, there's, there should be more, you know? There should be more people, and, you know, film music is, is a pretty, you know, white male industry, and it's, you know, that should change, and, and, and I'd like to see it change. Mm -hmm. We've, you Br know, brings other flavors, other feelings, it other emotions. It depend on the flavors, but, oh, but I just think that, you know, it's time to oh, yeah. really expand the, the, the dialogue a little bit. By far, absolutely. In, back to the film process, two things seem always inherent to me. One is a lot of committee decisions before it's all finalized and deadlines. Both true? Absolutely. Yeah. Beyond belief. Yeah. Just constant. Just so the committee decisions makes an interesting problem is when, when I get a piece of music that's, been, that's gone through committee, through a composer's pipeline and it gets delivered to me, I can't rethink it. I'm not allowed to just take it apart and rebuild it like you can sometimes do in a mix. Although nowadays I know that records sort of it's the same thing, but it's, it's been to enough people that it sort of fundamentally has to be the same piece of music. So I'm constantly ref checking, I'm constantly listening to the original piece of music to make sure that I haven't gone somewhere that, right. that isn't gonna be accepted. And, 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 that, and that all I'm doing is making what they had better, either with a live orchestra or with some processing, with some better reverbs, with taking a stereo thing and turning it into surround. Deadlines are brutal. I mean, it, you know, sometimes you end up working all night long to deliver a reel in the morning. It just yep. depends on how it is. You know, sometimes it's not so bad, but 
you know, I've been through two marriages, and if you ask my ex-wives about deadlines, well, there you well, go. <laughs> I'll tell you about it. Uh, we had a we had a guest, Josh Goodwin, super hot mixer, who was supposed to be a guest at Nam Jam yesterday, two days ago. His wife called me the night before and said, "Oh my God, we got to finish this for end title for Sia for this movie." It happens. You can't know. come. Can't do it. It happens. Yeah, it happens. Part of it. Alan, when 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 I was trying to copy you, the. the there were several things I just never got right. And now that I got you one to one, and you have to answer me because so that's not what true. we're doing here. Um, how did you get your low end so tight? Like your, your, your kick drums were just magic and tight, but yet they were not competing with the bass, which was just doing what a bass should do. Did you use a lot of parallel compression? Was so this is such an interesting conversation because I could ask you the exact same question. I ripped How you do you off. get your low end so tight? I ripped you it off. I tried to. But I don't know what you did. I was too embarrassed to ask you. There wasn't a formula. There wasn't a formula. You know, I, 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 I think when I grew up in New York, we had a rule that if it didn't need low end, you got rid of the low end. You know, if oh. the guitar didn't need anything below 100, you got rid of everything below 100. If the, you know, that's just sort of was, was the rule. But in terms of that bass bass drum relationship, you know, it, it, there were guys that were much more elegant about it who used to sort of like um, key, you know, keying compressors and stuff like that. That was never really my thing. I just sort of would mix it until it felt right, you know, and, and play with low end. I, I, you know, I had. I cheated. There were some samples that I used that were pretty reliable in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, giving me what I need. And, um, but you know, in the film world, low end is a whole nother ball game because you have so many elements that are fighting for, uh, for space down there, orchestral elements, percussive elements, and things like that. You really have to spend time working on it. And so what do I you, do in that? Do you do anything special for the subs? Like, like when I go, see, yeah. when I go see one of your movies, uh, or hear it at home because I don't go to a lot of movies. I'm sad to say, uh, the sub is spectacular. When it comes right. in, it's a, it's a moment. Are, are you? Using well, that's what I do. I like use moments in the sub. I don't do a ton of lot. I don't do a whole lot of stuff in the subwoofer because I tend to find that, you know, for me the music sounds better when I stay out of the subs except for effects like so if i have some low percussion i'll send that to the sub if i have some big synth pads that want to be just massive i'll send that to the sub but i try to do most of the musical work in the regular speakers and let the sound effects guys have the sub you know although sometimes i break that rule you know sometimes i'll just create a little bit of a feed from my orchestra for a little bit of an lfe just to kind of ride down there the old DBX120 trick, but now I use a, a plugin called the Low Ender instead, or Avid actually has a plugin that's called the Subharmonic that I use sometimes depending on, on how I want to track the harmonic content. They both do a little bit different thing. Yeah, it's the modeled bit. after a 120. What's that? It's modeled after a 120. Yeah, yeah. it's all modeled after a 120. Is working on the video, a video game similar to working on a movie? Working on video games, we tend to work in quad. There isn't a lot of, uh, there isn't a lot of data space for the music, or although that's changing now, so we tend to mix in quad without a subwoofer. You know, to imagine if you're in headphones and you're a video game player, there isn't really a subwoofer. Right. Um, and, and, uh, and most video gameplay happens on small speakers, so I tend not to listen on huge speakers when I mix video games, and we tend to do stuff. I'm doing a huge video game now for PlayStation. I'm doing the new Spider-Man. Mm. Actually, I'm leaving from here and going to Skywalker to record the next set of music for, for, um, cool. for Spider-Man. And uh, so we do that in quad. Wow. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Now, does television part of your oh, yeah. work as well too? Yeah. Same process, different. Ish. You know, I, I do more listening in stereo when I when I mix for television because although they do deliver in surround, most of the people watching it are going to listen to it in stereo. So I want to make sure that the stereo mix is exactly what I want it to be. When I mix for film, when I do my stereo down mix, I don't do any additional processing on the stereo mix. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I take that wrong. I, I, I don't do any additional processing on the, on the crash down. When I mix uh, uh, for TV, I might do a little bit of EQ just for that stereo TV mix. Got it. Do you, Got it. Do you sweat uh, collapsing to mono? Do you pay attention to that? 
When you're mixing in stereo, do you check it in mono just to see if it's uh, acceptable? Um, you know, I've been thinking about that recently because of people's, uh, you know, people are listening on their iPhones, and even though they're stereo, they're so close together. That's a valid thing to do again. I hadn't done that for years, but uh, I'm actually, I'm actually got my, I'm getting myself a pair of Oritones again. <laughs> and my trick with Oritones was, give me your water bottle. So when I used to set up Oritones, I, I couldn't quite. Get, wrap my head around actually listening in mono, so I would just put them next to each other like that, and I would call it mono. I got you know? that from you. I still do that. <laughs> I still do that. Um, so I'm going to actually get a set of Oritones. What I actually have in my studio, which is cool, is I have a little video game stereo uh, little playback system made by some company. It's really cool looking. And when I mix video games, I, my final mix pass is on those. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Now, might we have some questions for, for uh, OK. Uh, somebody's around with a microphone. Let's t try the. Oh, you're right, man. You are on it. Oh, thanks for being here. Hey. My question is actually along those same lines. When you're mixing a television, or I'm sorry, a movie score. Yeah. Uh, are you mixing for just the cinema experience with like dialogue and music volumes, or are you thinking about oh, this will go on a small, you know, plasma television screen, you know? And like, are you thinking about the end viewer listening experience or the, just the initial going to the cinema? By the way, one of the great film mixers right be, standing right behind you, Nathan Wong, everyone. Fantastic mixer. Nathan. Um, Nathan. You know, that's above my pay grade. So, so uh, <laughs> I don't, I'm not really that, you know, I am concerned about dialogue. I always, I always listen with dialogue and effects, but I'm not doing the final dialogue and effects mix. So they actually do a film mix where they're mixing for film, and then they do another mix for home deliverables. So they're actually listening, and it, not, it used to not be that way, but about five or six years ago, that became part of the, of the deliverables, where they would actually do a down mix on smaller speakers for, smaller speakers for home delivery. Anybody else? Good question. Back here, right behind you. Hi, thanks for being here. Yeah, hey, welcome. Really enjoy it. Um, I've got a mixed question also. If I'm not mistaken, Dunkirk was released, the 4K version, without an Atmos mix, which is kind of unusual. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, there was never an Atmos mix done on the movie. Why? Uh, Chris Nolan does not believe in Atmos. Why? Was, uh, Chris <laughs> Nolan is a very unique individual, and uh, one of the reasons his movies are so special is he has his own set of uh, sensibilities that are really his, you know? Like if you were to watch Interstellar and watch the scene where the car is driving through the cornfield, I guarantee you can't tell me what they're saying. Because his feeling is if I'm driving a car through a cornfield and someone is talking to me, I'm not gonna hear him, you know? So he wants the audience to have that same experience. He's probably right the, about that, but I don't agree with him about Atmos. Well, no, it's not, it, I just, it's just he doesn't, that's maybe the next movie he'll do that, but. We, we've, never, we've never delivered for Atmos, we've never mixed for Atmos. So it's not a trend, it's just that that particular movie doesn't happen to have Atmos. That, Chris Nolan movies don't have Atmos. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I'm on this side. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, is your final film mix uh, the soundtrack mix, or do you go back and adjust? Yeah. Um, Great uh, question. As, as often as I can, I go back. Uh, I use my stems, but what I like to do with the soundtrack mix is I like to turn off the picture. I like to have a couple of days where my brain could sort of decompress from working with film and surround and stuff, because otherwise stereo always sounds so small compared to that. I need to sort of like play around a golf or you know, or, or, you know, watch some bad TV or something like that and, and then come back in without picture because there are things that happen with music that relate to picture. There's booms that occur because there's something on the screen. There's, there's, you know, symbols that occur because there's something on the screen that won't make any sense when you just watch it as opposed to, when you just listen to it, so as opposed to just watching it and listening to it. So when I have the opportunity and, and I'm in the position to do it, which is about, 50% of the time, um, I like to go back and just take another pass at it. Usually sonically, but when I deliver the stereo mix with, m with my deliverables, what they call the deliverables, which are the stems, the six mix, and the two mix, it sounds pretty much the way I want it to sound. It's just really a matter of rebalancing a little bit. Do you like to go to movies? Or do you I, go to every I love going to movies. I go to movies all the time. <laughs> yeah. I hate hearing my mixes in movies. 
Do you have a um, a favorite or a fulfillment? You get done with your project, and all of a sudden done, you sit back and you go, "That's the one. That's 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 my thing, and I, I nailed it." Um, Eddie Kramer's is Hendrix doing Little Wing. That's the one that stands out in his. Do you have one of those? You know, it's it's so hard at this point because there's there you know there was such um, Gladiator changed my life. Okay, really did. It just it, it took me from someone who was sort of unknown to someone who people you know recognized and and uh, Thin Red Line changed my life. I'm not sure that when I listen to Gladiator, I go, that's, I nailed that mix. You know, uh, Fit Red Line, I pretty much nailed. But there are some scores that you've never heard of that I love. The Fan, you know, is a score that I love. Jumanji, I think, is a fan. I mean, 2017, I'm pretty damn proud of 2017. You know, it's, there isn't a whole lot I did in 2017 that I'm not proud of. But if there's one seminal moment where I can look back at it, it's really hard for me to, to evaluate that. I, I, you know, as a lot of people do, I tend to look at the flaws as opposed to the, um, yeah. you know, as opposed to the, the, the things that are people like. But there are certain scores that people always come up to me and, and, and love a lot. Traffic was one that I really loved just because it was something, I tried something that no one had tried and it worked, you know, so. It was a good movie too. What would have happened if it didn't work? I would have done it again. <laughs> right down here. Um, question, when you're approaching a, a scene that has maybe some atmospheric, uh, I don't know, synth or something, or s some light strings over the top, and there's dialogue there, when you're mixing and you're delivering those stems, are you mixing those uh, as far as like a, a musical balance to, c to kind of fit in with the rest of that, of that cue, or are you uh, delivering them kind of pulled back a little bit, knowing that's what the dub's gonna do? Tiny bit of both, you know, it's a, I, I, I always, I won't compromise a musical balance, you know, because of a dialogue moment, 100%, but I, when I'm working on stuff like that with atmospheric stuff or orchestral music that's really supporting dialogue, I'm never done until I listen to it with the dialogue, and I'll do it with the dialogue 10, 20 times, and I'll sit there, that's, that's my stock and trade, you know, I'll sit there with my, with my fader and trim, and I'm gonna work that, overall music until, and I know it's gonna get worked again, and I know the dub mixer's gonna do it again, but I feel like I can get to a place where it's really doing what it needs to do emotionally. So yeah, and I even make a hole, you know, sometimes like if there's a synth pad or an element that's really feels solid, I'll, you know, using delay or using some sort of technical, you know, trickery, I'll, I'll make sure that the center image is, feels a little bit skewed out so that I feel like there's a little bit of space there. I try not to put, I'm very, very austere about what I put in the center channel because I know that that's, you know, dialogue is king. And, and the thing I don't want them to do is pull all the music because of something dumb I did, you know? I'm trying to, I'm trying to get them to play the music as loud as the, the movie could support it. You know, that's my job. Dialogue tends to, tends to be in a certain frequency range. Do you ever pull that frequency down? Absolutely. Okay, so Absolutely. frequency. Too. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking a lot about frequency when it comes to the dialogue frequencies. Certain sounds are sitting there in the dialogue frequencies and I'll, I'll shift the frequency a little bit. I mean, there are times I even, like literally, you, uh, I'll, I'll pitch change certain things just to sort of, where it won't matter, where it's not tone based, where it's just a sound and I'll, dro I'll drop it a half a step or something like that, just to sort of get it to clear away from dialogue a little bit. Cool. Anybody on this side, question? There you go. Uh, going uh, to the music, um, when you're working with composers and when they're trying to convey a, a moment of, or emotion, uh, you know, for me, when I go to movies, I, I hate to feel manipulated right. in a way. Do right. you work with composers? Well, in, when you're listening and, and, and doing your mix, uh, how do you, is there something that you can do to kind of say, I, I don't want to give you, give them that much at that moment or? Y yes, yes. And, and, and the thing is a good composer, you know, there's this, that's, that's what I, that's what that is to me. When, when I hear something and it's hitting dialogue and I go like, eh, it's a little too on the nose, you know. Um, a good composer will avoid that. But in a mix, you can do the same thing. You can, I mean, like a boom right on a cut. You know, we try to 
I try to not <laughs> nail cuts. You know, if I could, unless it's m my job, you know, it's required of me to particularly nail a cut. I try not to nail cuts. I try to be a little bit off of the edit. You know, I, I, I think a lot about that. I don't want, you know, musical, emotionally, I try not to, I don't want to, it's like, there's no, I don't want them to cry because I tell them to cry or, or because the music tells them to cry. But what I want to do is I want, I want to like gently, you know, nudge them to, towards that thing. You know, the, the music can do magical stuff for that, but there absolutely is a problem with certain things being on the nose. Um, I think that that's more uh, an issue compositionally Check than it, it is mix-wise, but I try to help it when I can. So we were talking about the importance of women in, in the business and coming yes. through. So we just wanted to point out somebody. Paula, where are you? Did you disappear? Where's Paula Salvador? Paula, Paula. step right there. Hi, Raise Paula. Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Paula's so, one of my best, dearest friends in this business for years. Paula runs Capital Studios. She runs Capital Studios. When I talked about traffic, the, the magic thing I did with traffic was they decided they wanted a synth score, but they wanted it to sound organic. So I called Paula, I said, I want to book Studio A. And she says, what's the band? I said, it's me and a bunch of synths and a bunch of speakers. And we just set up microphones and speakers throughout the studio. And I pumped sounds out into the studio and re-recorded them back in and used that as organic ambience around traffic. And it was, it changed everything. We ended up doing it on The Prestige. We ended up doing it on Michael Clayton and all these great movies, all at Capitol. There's something magic about that. Paul has been one of the one of the stalwart like bastions of this industry, and, and it's an honor to have her here. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and let me just say, male or female, if you ever wanted information, you cannot believe the seminal rock record she's been around, the kind of movement she's been around, number of studios on both coasts, and now running Capital. Amazing lady. We love you, Paula. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, any other questions? Right here, my man. Sort of a vague question, but how do you, or do you train your ears to hear what you want them to hear, or to hear the final product before it's done? Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, you know, ears train themselves after a while. I, I, have a rel I have a great control room that, uh, my studio, I'm really comfortable mixing in it. I can hear really clearly. I have a habit, a tendency of, I'll finish the mix to where I think it's done, and then I like to have other people come in the room because I hear differently when someone else is in the room. When I know that there's another set of ears, all of a sudden I'll hear the low end's not right, or, you know, it just, it's incredible how that works. Um, so that's where I got that, from you. Yeah, I have to hear it with someone else in the room. Sometimes I hope it's not the composer, but if it's the composer, it's the composer. Um, um, but, um, I. I, I'm not a big, and I'll tell you why, I'm not a big lover of listening to someone else's work and then trying to mix, because I find myself trying to copy what they did. Or I, I lost a whole record career because of Chris Lord Algae. You know, for, I went through this period where it's just like everything, I wanted it to sound like Chris Lord Algae, and I, all I could be was a bad B-grade Chris Lord Algae instead of a really good Alan Meyerson. So, so I don't tend to listen to, you know, Sean Murphy's work or Dennis Sand's work when I mix. Maybe I'll do it later at home or something like that, but I don't tend to compare what I'm doing with something else. I try to treat it as a unique thing. Otherwise, I end up despairing with my comparing, you know. During your CLA period, did you wear the cap? No, it was, it was pre-cap. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> well, you have hair. <laughs> That's why. Chris, exactly. Chris, Can I tell one last story? Sure, of course. So when I first moved to L.A., um, Alan was my hero. And somebody told me that he bought a 300ZX red twin turbo. So I went out stolen. And bought, so I went out and bought a 300ZX twin turbo, hoping it would help me be like Alan Meyerson. It didn't work. That car got stolen, by the way. And oh, that's what happened. You, you just yeah, it, my it, <laughs> and you but, lived in yours. I, I was, <laughs> exactly. I, back in the days before cell phones, I was at a golf course. It got stolen from the parking lot, and I ended up having to go to the police precinct carrying my golf clubs, wearing metal spikes. The police were not happy with me. <laughs> that's funny. You know, he's such a nice, he's such a great guy. But the minute he showed up and he showed all, he showed me a lot of this stuff and this love that he gave. I was really 
Preston. Then the minute I walked into, I was in Studio B at Enterprise. He was in Studio C at Enterprise. And I listened to his mix. I felt like quitting. <laughs> and you both left in your 300. <laughs> yes. uh, guys, thank you for coming. Give a round of applause to Alan Meyerson. Thank you for the support of Pensado's Place. Have a great NAM. Come up, take a picture, do whatever, meet our guests. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Uh -huh.